Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking's bi-weekly podcast. I'm here with Fine Woodworking Deputy Art Director John Tetro. Hello. Creative Director and author of the best-selling book, The How and Why of Woodwork, or The Why and How of Woodworking. Sorry, took a little. Mike Pekovich. Do you want to try that again? Yeah. Okay. Whole thing? <laughs> yeah, pretty <All> much. Right. <laughs> oh, just, just mine. John's was good. All right, okay. And the author of the best-selling book, The Why and How of Woodworking. Right on. Mike Pekovich. Thanks. Hey, guys. And the author of 20 Hairstyles That'll Make You Look 10 Years Younger, Jeff Rose. <laughs> I didn't I get a reaction to that one. I really, I was proud of that one. I was giggling <laughs> at my desk. No? All right. Uh, I'm your host, Ben Strano. If you have questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them into shoptalkattaunton.com. You can also use the voice memo app on your phone and email us a 30-second audio recording. Or you can leave a voicemail by calling 203-304-3456. Any links or articles we mention will be on this episode's show notes page, which can be found at shoptalklive.com. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button and leave a comment about how we're, how, about how we're all a bunch of hacks. Wow, tough room. <laughs> YouTube's been tough lately. All right. <clears throat> uh, we have a pretty big sweepstakes coming up. And I don't know if you guys know about this. No, what are we doing? We're giving away with Jessam like a fifteen hundred dollar router table setup. Ooh, nice. Wow. So that's it's, like include like the lift in there. Yeah, too? it's it's cool. everything. Except the motor, I think. But um so it's, it's to correspond with uh we just as of this one, as of let's see, this is posting nine fourteen, so we'll be on episode three or so of Bob Van Dyke's video workshop of router table mm -hmm. fundamentals. And uh, that was a fun one to record. It was kind of quick and dirty. I didn't know you guys were even doing that. I know. We, we, we got in and we got out. Cool. Yeah. But Bob's one of those guys who's just always got so many killer techniques and everything. And yeah. he's so good at breaking down things on multiple levels for beginners it's great, but it's also one of those things, just about anything Bob does, you're, you're going to pick up at any skill level. You're going to pick up information that you didn't have going into it. Oh, Bob is great. I mean, I teach there quite a bit, and I'll run through a presentation on a machine or, or a setup or something like that. I will nail it. I will mention, like, every single possible thing pertinent to this operation, and I'm ready to go, and Bob goes, oh... Yeah, and another thing, and he'll rattle off like 20 other things which are like vitally important to know as well. It's like, oh, shoot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah, do that too. So, yeah, Bob has been doing it a really long time and, um, yeah, just nails that stuff. So wh where do you guys stand on the router table? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Safety first. <laughs> Why would you stand on your router table? <laughs> Especially because you have a benchtop router table. That yeah. would be quite, quite iffy. Uh, uh, I've always, I mean, for me, the router has always been a necessary evil in my shop. It just does things well enough to where you are forced to use it for certain things. Router table, I would almost put in that category. But the router table is such an efficient, accurate tool that it's hard to begrudge it. So yeah. I, I don't begrudgingly use my router table. I use it when I need to, but I, I like it quite a bit once I get set up and use it. There's there's certain tasks where it's just so efficient yeah. that it absolutely overwhelms any misgivings of noisiness or whatever. Yeah. And um, we have uh, one of the fancy, fancy router lifts in the shop at work. And I feel like I'm not going to be able to use my shop-made wow. router table at home when it, when the time comes because it's just so – it's so nice to be able to perfectly dial in whatever setting you want. That's a huge thing is the router lift. Yeah, Once yeah. you get a router lift rather than just bolting your router base to the bottom of a piece of plywood, it becomes a different machine. Yeah. What I do feel you like have? you would use it more too. You know, yeah. like when it's easy to just walk up to it and easily adjust up and down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you think of using it more often. Yeah. At least the one in the shop, that's how it happens for me. Right. The one I have at home uh, is a little bench top one. It's actually under a bench because I rarely use it. Uh -huh. um, 
they usually keep it set up for uh, like rails and styles, you know, to put a groove in there. Oh, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I don't use it that much. I use it all the time because it's... What do you use it for, like primarily? Um, we have a decent supply of router bits. So um, if I need to make a V block, uh, we've got that that V groove bit um, that I use for all the time for chamfers and making V blocks, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing sliding dovetails and you, you've got a square piece, no ends ifs or buts, uh, that's my go-to. Um, I've got a project coming up where, uh, I'm needing to do, it's, it's a complicated project because I'm, I'm making some urns for, uh, my best friend's father. Mm. And it is, I'm using the wood from his first home that he cut down a tree, had it milled up and it's been sitting there for like 20 years. So like... I have a short supply of this lumber and one of the problems with it, and I'll, I'll mention one, this will come back up, but one of the problems that I've been running into is that, um, I don't, I'm, I'm unable to use techniques for safety reasons that I normally would like cutting a groove, uh, in a long piece of wood mm -hmm. and then cross cutting the, the styles out of it. You know, if I'm doing a frame and panel, um, I'm literally having to, I've got this five inch piece of wood that right. I need to turn into a style right. for a frame and panel, uh, door. And you really wind up doing things that you're not comfortable with on a table saw. And for me, a router table is much easier to control okay. small pieces, you know, with a backer block. Yes. Um, a jig to hold it. Yep. yep. It's, it's, it's. I've really been needing to figure out ways to do things that I normally would not go with. You know, a table saw many times is the most efficient tool in your shop. Yeah. But for small pieces, router table is – that's been the MVP hmm. right now. So. Cool. cool. Yeah. But uh, head on over to findwoodworking.com slash sweepstakes and uh, enter to win the whole – Router table lift. Um, they've got the when I forget what Justin calls them, but like the guide wheels or whatever that hold your the the stock guides right that yeah, hold your yeah. your stock uh, up to the fence, and it's you know really really awesome setup. So findwoodworking.com slash sweepstakes. Cool. Um, all right, let's head to question number one, and it is from Larry. After treating myself to a new set of bench chisels, I flattened and polished the backs and honed them to a sharp edge. Now I have a nice set of chisels that hold an edge better than the ones I've used for the last 20 years, but I have doubled my, bo my upper body strength from the effort. Do you, have, do you do anything to the bottom edges of the chisels to soften them as you may after flattening a hand plane? I know I want a sharp side edge at the tip, but I'm thinking about using a stone to soften the bottom edge, starting an inch or more back from the tip, just to make them more comfortable in the hand. Is this a bad idea? I should be so lucky as to live long enough to hone the tip back to where, back an inch to where this would be a problem. I'm going through the same thing right now. Yeah. I just Are you knew got the Veritas PMV 11s. New. What you got? I've got the Stanley 750s, same as Larry. Actually. And they're sharp too. They they know they are now. After I flatten the back, though, they're very sharp. The mm. the the back edge, right? The, the cord, where right. you're holding it, right? Is yeah, it's uncomfortable. I never that never used to be an issue until I got Japanese chisels, which can be like really really sharp. I know the Lee uh, Valley Veritas PMV eleven chisels are like really, really sharp. And um, so that a lot of students come in with that and they ask the same questions. And um, nah, I mean, Bob Van Dyke, who says he doesn't mind just hitting it with some fine like emery paper or something like that, just to kind of take off that corner. And I think that, um, I think this letter writer is correct in that 
for me personally, I don't want a rounded edge all the way up to the cutting edge because yeah. you're going to end up with a non-flat surface in those corners. So I think to, yeah, keep yourself an inch or so back, and I agree, that's a whole lot of sharpening before you you hit that. Yeah. But yeah, I would say um, I would never – I didn't do that to any of my, my Japanese chisels. I just sort of – adapted my technique to not be gripping the chisel on the sides. It's always, you know, you're pinching it top to bottom. So, I mean, I do think there is technique involved, but don't be afraid to knock that edge off if it really bothers you. Yeah. I've, I've done that too. I have uh, Lee Nielsen and some old Stanley 750s, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. after flattening, I've got, you know, got little cuts just from pairing and you're doing yeah. different things, maneuvering and not really thinking about how you're holding it. Um, so yeah, an inch back or so I've just hit it with sandpaper a little bit. Yeah. And I mean, also, you know, 30 years from now when you've sharpened an inch back, it's not like you're never taking metal off, off the back in your sharpening process. Right. Yeah. So 30 years from now you're sharpened an inch back, but also the chisel's probably a little bit shallower. Yeah. And you could probably effort. also joint that sidewall just a little bit just to get rid of that round over too and get you back to sharp mm. if you need to. I started to go through the process of on one of on one of my chisels. There's 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 a little bit of machining marks. And I started to go through the process of like trying to grind them out and like make the Stanley seven fifties look like Lee Nielsen's. <laughs> And after one, I was like, this is stupid. This is this is too much work. <laughs> Just deal with it. And <laughs> you know, they're they're great chisels. Um, they're not Lee Nelson's, and the price reflects that, yeah. you know. So uh so what do you think? Just hit it with some 220? Uh I have never done that personally to my own chisels. Um, I think if you want to, go ahead. It's not a big deal. Um, one of my really good friends who's a woodworker, he also happens to live next door to Toshio Odate, who's like the master of Japanese We're hand tools. putting a ding sound ding. in for Toshio Odate. No, no, no. Um, and Toshio gave my friend a chisel to use, and we were sitting together, and my friend complained that, you know, Toshio, the, the edges on the chisel you gave me, it's too sharp. I keep cutting my fingers. Toshio just stared at him. And then just said, you're using them wrong. <laughs> so, although that was not directed directly to me, <laughs> in a sense, I feel that it was. So it, also, it's sort of like guitar playing where you first uh, you start playing guitar. You have to like build up the calluses. Yeah. You build up calluses where you get those slices on the sides of your fingers and you get enough like kind of scar tissue built up to where you don't get those slices anymore. Yeah. So, it, and it, it, it becomes a source of pride. Yes. You walk around, look at my calluses. Yes. I, I actually have new calluses from like Sloyd Knife. Oh, see. You, you know, and, yeah. and it's a little bit annoying. And every now and then I feel it's like, yeah, that's come from doing something. Yes. So, yeah. Hard work. Yeah. All yes. right. Well, so Toshio Dati would not do that, Larry. Yeah. So take that for what it's worth. Right. All right. Question number two is from Cameron. And again, this is one. I swear, people are just sending in questions that I'm kind of, or maybe they're just the ones I pick. <laughs> I'm kind of looking for answers for it too. But from Cameron, uh, I live in the northeastern United States with hot, humid summers and sub-freezing winters. My shop is set up in an uninsulated garage. I'm thinking of setting up a secondary workbench in my basement for hand tool work when the temperatures are on the extreme ends of the scale. What risks are there with sudden temperature and humidity changes? For example, if I were to bring parts inside to cut dov dovetails, should I store them back in the garage when I'm done? Hmm. I love the idea of two workbenches. And I think I'm going to put a workbench in my living room. This means your workbench <laughs> is not in the right place if you have to have two of them. No. Nah, I... I can't afford to heat my shop. I have two workbenches, but one is my outfeed table and the other one's a workbench. So <laughs> in, your, in your wonderful I, heated shop. And I air stand conditioned corrected. Shop. I like two workbenches too. That's cool. So John, you're kind of in the same situation. You have an unheated shop, but then you also yeah. work in the fine woodworking shop, which is like super heated. <laughs> well, super heated, non-insulated, which means it's like super, super dry. Yeah. It's kind of like a kiln. <laughs> 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 A nice one. Yeah. So how do you, do you just, 
okay, if you're working in the fine working shop, you're just there and your stock stays there as you're working? Yep. Yeah, usually it's a project that I'm working on there and right. bring it home when it's done. Um, so the, there's never parts traveling to and from? No, just rough stock bringing it there, usually. And for anyone who doesn't know, there's lots of John's rough stock down in the <laughs> Yeah, there is. have to move some of that. <laughs> he has pallets worth. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also have worked on my kitchen table, like when I had a project at home and it was, you know, 30 degrees out. Mm -hmm. um, trying to remember what it was. Uh, I think it was like a, that Maloof style rocker I made years ago. Yeah. And it was to a point where everything was glued up and it was just kind of time for the sculpting part. And I just threw a blanket on our kitchen table and worked on it that weekend. Just, yeah. you know, rasps and those little microplanes. Mm -hmm. um, but that wasn't, I didn't feel like it was going to move a lot. I wasn't, you know, cutting joints that were going to change when I brought it back to the shop. It's all pretty beefy stock. Yeah. Not, and it was already you know, assembled and glued, it was up. glued it's up. just, it's yeah. going to be, yeah, yeah. But it's going to be cool. But as far as, like he's talking about dovetails. I mean, if you brought just one, you know, the dovetail board into the cellar and worked on that and brought it back out and tried to line it up with the pin board, it's, there's going to be issues. You know, you want to work you with... You think so? Yeah. yeah. You, definitely. If, I mean, if you have to do that and bring it inside, you want to bring both those parts that you're going to be joining and put them together in that climate. Yeah. It's um, tough. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think you... You need to be, I think, strategic about your working situation. I don't think you ever want to go back and forth, back and okay. forth. Um, at some point, you want to be working. Whatever your shop environment is, your stock should be acclimated to that. So it's not actively moving one way or the other, expelling or sort of sucking up moisture from the air. It's just kind of at equilibrium yeah. uh, for that point in time. So... You know, I think if you can do all your milling in the, you know, in the shop or, or, I don't know. I mean, I think you're kind of onto something, Cameron. I might bring all my stock into my basement, let it acclimate there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, run out if I have a joiner and planer in my garage. And, okay, so it's out there for half an hour, an hour mm -hmm. while I'm milling all my stock to get it flat and then bring it back into the basement. I think that's okay. Yeah. So it's almost... The opposite. So just acclimate the stock to your basement. Yeah. Mill it real quick, bring it back in. Yeah, so it continues to be acclimated. What I wouldn't want to do, sort of what, what John, you were talking about, is I wouldn't want to bring something into the shop to do intricate joinery, which really depends on stable stock. And then that starts to move. That can be, that can be tough. It's not an ideal situation, but... You know, figure out where you're going to be doing your, I would say where you're doing your bench work. You know, mm -hmm. the majority of your um, joinery, fitting parts, um, acclimate it to that. Do everything you need to do in the other shop that you have to as quick as you can, but then bring it back in. I guess that would be my thing. Do you, um, do either of you store pieces like at... Say you've cut dovetails, you're not ready to assemble yet. Yeah. Do you do anything when you're storing them other than sticker the pieces? Um, I know Bob Van Dyke, we need a ding for him too now. Um, I know that he's big on wrapping pieces in, in that saran wrap right. kind of stuff. Or just even to, shoving everything in a black plastic bag. Shove it in a black plastic bag. And then just, and then just wrap it, wrap it, wrap it. And he'll do that to like a tabletop he had sitting... Um, in a bag like that, I think he said like for over a year and he pulled it out and it was still dead flat, hmm. which was amazing. So it's it's more the plastic is keeping moisture from transmitting into or out of the board as right. opposed to the saran wrap holding the pieces in piece I, in, in place. Like. I, well, I think it's both because if – and this is another thing. I switch my technique. I always used to always, always, always sticker all my stock through every step of the process. Um, which on one hand is good because the very worst thing you want to do is take a flat panel and put it down on a flat surface. So that surface is protected from the air, but the top surface isn't because that's going to move immediately. So 
one hand, you, you want to sticker everything. Um, Bob's take is while you're milling, you definitely want to sticker it to let it move, get the air all around it, let it do what it wants to do. But once you start working it, his thing is you stack it, but you stack all the parts flat on top of each other, and then you just put another board or something on top of that. So you're really minimizing contact to the air of all the parts as much as possible. Uh -huh. And I've sort of moved more towards that. If I have a bunch of – I'm doing a bed, so I have these – for footboard, headboard panels that are large and flat. I throw them on the workbench, stack them right up on top of each other, get the, the bedpost legs, put those on top, another piece of plywood or MDF on top of that if I have to, but I'm, I'm sort of going more towards that just direction. Holding in place. Yeah, yeah, holding and protecting it from just exposing the, the large faces to the air. I mean, obviously the end grain is still going to be absorbing or expelling moisture in the long term, but that doesn't seem to be as big of an issue. Yeah. So, and that's in your um, kind of controlled shop too. Like the temperature and humidity isn't changing too much. Yeah, it's pretty. So stable. you kind of have less. Right. To worry about there. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. The next thing we're moving on to is our all-time favorite technique of all time for this week. Who wants to start? Good, John. Uh, mine's a little weird. Awesome. With uh, something that came across this week. Um, a few years ago, I built a wall cabinet out of pine that had this little integrated door pull um, where the style is a little wider that extends past the side of the cabinet. Then there's a little cutout in the side of the cabinet. Um, so the first time I made that, uh, I used different size gouges and didn't really have the right size. So it was kind of finicky to get this um, circumference that you're carving, but also it has like a concave part to it. Right. Okay. Um, so I'm, you know, trying to get gouges in there and a little finessing to get it right. Um, so now I'm building kind of a mirror image cabinet to go with this one, kind of like a book matched thing. And this time... Uh, I kind of forgot what I did the first time through, <laughs> which happens a lot. Yes. <laughs> um, and I saw in the shop, we have these little um, quarter inch shank uh, drum, sanding drums. Mm -hmm. And I looked at one that looked about the same diameter of that little circumference I was carving and chucked it in a little uh, cordless drill. And it was really slick. It was just <laughs> so fast. And it was like about, you know, the right arc but you could kind of hold it at that angle to, to work down the, mm -hmm. the curve of the circle for that little specific part. Cool. Um, so that's, it's a weird technique, but I could see how someone could use that for something else, you know, where you're not, not something, it kind of has to be like a little detail because if you're kind of wrenching on the, the drill with that, you know, you could be harming your cordless drill, but um, for something small, you're just kind of a light touch and carving mm -hmm. something. It's kind of nice to have that control, having it on the drill, cordless drill, instead of in a drill press where you're right. a little more restricted. Now, you're you're a big fan of uh, the micro rasps. Is, it, is that what they're called? Yeah. They're pretty sweet. They're Which is basically, I mean, it looks like a like a kitchen utensil. I mean, they sell them as kitchen utensils, right? It's, it's, is that what I, they're, they're, they're I, called, micro rasps? I forget. Yeah. For micro, zesting lemons. Microplane. Yeah. <laughs> microplane. <laughs> microplane, yeah. Yeah. But I can't remember what it was designed for. If it was either designed for culinary use and then they started marketing it for woodworking or vice versa. But they work great for both. And they have cylinder versions. Have you used those? No. I'm a little afraid of those. Okay. <laughs> they just look so aggressive. Like, yeah. I don't know. I haven't tried those yet. Um, you had mentioned this yesterday and I, I had the thought that could you use – a hole saw to make a plug of varying sizes or a set hmm. of plugs of varying sizes, glue a dowel in or a steel pin or something like that to become your arbor. And make your own to chuck specific it to the drill. size. Yeah, and then yeah. you can have any size you want. Yeah. I think I, I would see why not. thread like a long bolt through a block of wood and turn it so that way – the, and then you chuck the bolt in your three-jaw chuck in your lathe uh -huh. or your drill press chuck in your lathe and then turn it so the outside 
circumference is exactly centered around your your post. Yeah, that's good. And then what do you, you you put a saw kerf in to wrap sandpaper into? Didn't Michael sure. Fortune do that? Yeah, yeah. I'm picturing that article. I yeah. think it was Michael Fortune. Okay. Yep. Okay. That was specifically for a drill press too. I hmm. think. But yeah, I mean, your idea, Ben, like the hole saw will give you a centered hole. Yeah. So there you go. I guess that'd work. Never mind. That's a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> God, that's a lot easier too. <laughs> but I, and I mean, I've got just from having owned a home for the past six years or whatever, I have random hole saws all over the place of all sorts of different sizes. Oh, so right. you just find the one that you need. Pop out a plywood disc. Yeah. Yeah. Zip, zip, zip. Oh, that's really smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was your technique then. Yeah. It's, it's dealing Mike's thunder. A good technique is, yeah, that's good. I've heard of that. A really good technique is, oh, I haven't heard of that. That's good. And then like the best technique makes you a little bit sad. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's so smart. I yeah. wish I would have known that a long time ago. Yeah, there's a lot of those that go around in this job. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you got, Ben? I'll go next. All right, mine is, it's almost part tool, part technique, but as I was talking about before, I'm, I'm having to cut all of these pieces, and they're small, and you just don't always feel safe on a table saw. And um, the smaller a piece gets, it's almost, it's almost like the more the danger level ramps up yes. uh, on a table saw or any power tool, right? You always want to keep the, the piece as big as you can while, while... For as long as you can. Yeah. yeah. While, you know, doing joinery, whatever. And um, like I said, I've got these boards and I've got to make the these boxes out of them. And I've got like five inches there. I've got this. So I was... Um, I was doing some um some grooves and i wound up finishing it on the router table <laughs> but uh while i was doing it i was i was starting the grooves on the longer pieces and doing the whole you know i've just got the blade raised up somewhere in the middle run the groove flip it over run the groove um so you get a centered groove and when i got to the 5 inch long piece it just the alarm bell was going off in my head. I was like, you know, this isn't this isn't cool. Um, so I did a couple of things to stack the odds in my favor, safety wise. Mm -hmm. And one of them was I, I had the pieces were all of uniform thickness, so I threw a, a feather board on there. Cool. Um, and that holds everything tight to the to the fence. It keeps everything in place. Great. The other thing was. And I don't think I'm going to use a table saw without this feature, the ability to turn the table saw off with your leg mm -hmm. without removing your hands. Yeah. And so that, that's why I say it's, it's part tool, it's part technique, but it is having that paddle switch right next to your left leg. Mm. And I was able to run, run the piece over the blade, hold it perfectly in place with, with a push stick, turn it off. And just wait for the blade to slow to, to to come to a stop, and it took forever, and that's why I wound <laughs> up moving over to the router table of, of eventually. <laughs> but it really was one of those without the ability to turn that table saw off with my leg, I don't think I would have ever gone that far with mm. it. Yeah, taking your eyes off that, you don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah. So it's like as as the pieces get smaller. You have to stack the odds more in your favor, yes. safety wise. Yeah, and that's one key element for me was was using using that paddle switch on on the table saw. And I mean, sure, we have a saw stop. Um, I, a, I don't want to be the guy who comes into work the next day and says I'm set off the break. <laughs> and B, just mentally, I I always assume in my head that 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 break. And that particular saw stop at any moment is is not going to do the thing that it's yes. supposed to do. I, and, and people say, oh, they just – they make you lazy with it. They oh, make you – Yes. And I'm like, no, no. <laughs> this one I don't trust. I don't trust this table saw any more than I trust any other table saw. Yeah. 
um, there's an insurance policy, but I'm not, I'm still not going to wander into the territory that I know I shouldn't. Yes. But, um, yeah, just the, that paddle switch, it just made me feel so much safer last night. And that's, that's my technique. Cool. That's a good technique. Thanks. Um, I kind of have a mashup of techniques. Okay. Uh, so I'm working on a, on a bed, kind of, um, uh, arts and crafts ish style. Not really. Um, so number one, I'm making a bed, queen size bed. It's like, oh, how big is a mattress? Oh, shoot. Okay, that's the mattress size. How much room do I need? How high is a mattress off the ground? And all this stuff. So it's all these things where it's like, eh, I don't know, and I don't want to figure it out, and I don't want to start from scratch. So I look up the latest good bed article, which they're all awesome in fine woodworking. Actually, it might not be the latest. Michael Cullen might have been yeah. the latest. But I looked up the Kevin Rodell bed, which is a really classic sort of stickly style bed, but with some really awesome inlay hmm. in the panels. Anyway, I just pulled up Kevin Rodell's bed. Oh, end rails this long, side rails this long, um, this high off the ground. I'm good. So it's just... Uh, like, don't start from scratch if you don't have to. Yeah. Something that involves ergonomics, sort of like, you know, a dining table. Well, a dining table is going to be 30 inches off the ground. It just does. And the aprons can't be so wide that your knees bonk them when you pull the chair underneath. It's like that sort of thing. That's really, really simple stuff is sort of ingrained in your brain to begin with. But something like a bed that I don't make beds enough to store that info. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> So it's sort of like, you know, even if it's an original piece, I'll take a look at plans or furniture whenever I can just to sort of help me get a head start. And I love Kevin's bed. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I think it's a perfectly realized design. It's not the design I was going for. So I wasn't looking at it saying, oh, what's wrong with that? I'll fix it. It was like, okay, I kind of know what I want. Um, I know the feel in terms of the height of the headboard and the footboard. Um, so I was able to look at that finished piece and just kind of say, no, my headboard's not going to be quite that high. My footboard is going to be closer, but maybe a little bit less. And then go to the dimensions and say, well, if that was 45 inches, I'm going to go maybe 41 or kind of adjust it that way. It's this notion of <clears throat> if you have sort of a picture of something in your mind, even if it's not clear, if you give, your you give yourself a chance to sort of compare what's in your mind to something in reality – it's a really good way to dial in the scale of a piece, which can be really hard. So if I'm doing like a shaker chimney cupboard, when I did that, I looked at every filing cabinet, every cardboard box around me in the office or anywhere I went. And I just like looked at the filing cabinet, not too wide, not high enough, too deep. You know, it's like, where'd that come from? Well, I don't know. It's just, I just know compared to what I have in my mind, that's not right. So... You know, starting with an original, uh, someone else's plan, someone else's finished piece as a springboard to help you dial in the overall scale um, of a piece, I think it's a really, really um, certainly helpful thing for me, and I'm not afraid to do that. So when yeah. when we when I made our bed, I didn't do that, hmm. and I think I just Googled like the size of a mattress. Yeah, and I made the bed the size of the mattress, and that's great. Except when you're changing the, sh the sheets, oh. because it is exactly the size that <laughs> <laughs> it is entirely the size of that mattress. So it's like you got to jam the mattress yeah. into the side rails, and um, I've gotten used to it, and I've I've come to like it. But the top of the mattress is way too high off the floor, yeah, and it kind of feels like you're in a castle up there, or something now, you know. <laughs> but I, yeah, I I just pulled measurements off the internet. And but not a furniture of the of the mattress, uh -huh. and it really didn't work. And I remember um, the problem was we always had a full size mattress, and then we bought a queen size. We didn't have the bed to go along with, didn't have bed rails, didn't have yeah. anything. I told my wife, I was like, I can build a bed in one yes. day, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. And it's a fine bed, and um, but <laughs> it was one of those foam mattresses that expands, right? So. It was sitting there in the box in the corner. I'm building the bed, and we get ready to do it, and and it it 
puffs out and I go to start jamming it into the bed <laughs> and I was like, oh no. And I'm sitting there racking my brain. How do I widen the headboard and the footboard? I've got this joinery done. You know, I mean, this bed is made. Yeah. And thankfully this mattress just has enough spring or Look, whatever yeah, to just be able to jam it in. in there. And and I feel like it keeps the sheets on the bed a little bit better because That's right. yeah. there's no room for them yeah. to, to come flying off. But, yeah. yeah. My first bed commission, you know, and, and the standard uh, piece of advice, which is really, really smart, have your client buy the mattress first or at least pick it out. It's like, go pick out your mattress. Tell me exactly the mattress you want, whether or not you want the box spring or not with it yeah. designed. Because, you know, like mattresses, I think they're sort of coming back a little bit to more reasonable heights. But for a while with the whole pillow top, mm -hmm. cushion top, you could get mattresses, which were like 24 inches thick. It's like, <laughs> uh. so I read in like an old article in Fine Woodworking that said the standard box spring height, nine inches, standard mattress height, nine inches. So I said, well, if that's standard, I'll go ahead and just make the bed to fit that. And of course I delivered this bed, shaker four poster bed and they put the box spring on, then they put the mattress on, and there's no more headboard. It oh, completely no. disappeared. It's like, uh, um, how about we go without the box spring? And then I had to tell them how it's not necessary, and, you know, take it back or whatever, and they were okay with that. But then I had to run out that night, run to Home Depot, get some, I think, some poplar stock, and and make all these slats to sort of create a base because, you know, the box spring just sat on little cleats on the side rail. So I had to go and make all the slats in order to put the mattress down. And it was really, really stressful. And then you put the mattress in and it looked really good. It was like still like, uh, still like two inches too high. You know, it's just like, and then you put the pillows and it's like, oh, okay. You know, it's like, it was okay. Yeah. But. That's a really good rule is, is buy check the out mattress, mattress first. Yeah, at least figure it out. And so the bed I'm making, did I do that? No, I didn't do that. <laughs> However, I looked at more recent information on approximate heights. And also um, the bed is for my son, so it's staying in our house. And I get to choose the mattress that goes on it. <laughs> so I'm just going to bring my tape measure to the store and, you know. Hopefully, and he can deal with it. Yeah. Hopefully it's not like the most expensive mattress is the exact height. Yeah. It's just like, no. Nah. Well, and that, that's one great thing about Kevin's plans too is it it is sized to work with a box spring with the appropriate hardware or you just move the right. the slats up or whatever. So you can kind of there's, customize there's some this. There's there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, there, yeah. If if – if you're going to base a design off anything, Kevin's is a great place to start because yeah. he's really thought through all of the different options yeah. and hardware. I'm thinking you could also go like with your foam mattress. You could go with a foam mattress and then you get yourself one of those like retractable utility blades that oh, come John. out like nine inches. <laughs> You just adjust after. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure my wife would have thought that was a great idea. Just an inch. <laughs> it would have been easier than changing the size. Of <laughs> I felt so stupid about that one. Her son's crib has a mattress that you literally have to take it out to get the sheet on. It's like that tight. Mm. So yeah, that's the other thing. You could just take your mattress off every time you have to get sheets on. Well, yeah, that's pretty much what you have to do. You have to pull the entire side up, yeah. get the sheet on, and jam it in there. But it sheets, works. Sheets stay on. And I built a bed in a day. Hmm. I was, I'm still impressed by that feat. I did the same thing. We got a mattress and box spring. I said, I'll make the bed. We're not going to buy one, except instead of a day, I think it took eight years. <laughs> <laughs> and then by the time we actually got the... You know, the bed frame and put the mattress on it. We kind of needed to buy a new mattress. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to uh, go over some spoon carving discussions because this question has been kicked down the road. Yes, it has. I'm glad we're getting to it. Too many times. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This episode of Shop Talk Live is supported in part by Furniture Medic. Woodworking is your passion and you know it well. Did you know that you can turn it into a rewarding business? That's just one reason to franchise with Furniture Medic. They'll give you what you need to get started when you join their award-winning brand that provides top-of-the-line training, support, and business guidance. From cabinet restoration and refacing to insurance claim repairs, residential services, commercial maintenance, and moving, you'll restore and repair wood of all kinds. 
Visit FurnitureMedicFranchise.com to get started. This is not an offering to sell a franchise. Furniture Medic is a registered trademark of ServiceMaster Brands Management. This February, experience the joy of hands-on learning with Masterclasses in Craft at Fine Woodworking's first ever hands-on event. Taking place at the Florida School of Woodwork, February 1st, this three-day event is a unique opportunity to expand your skills through personalized instruction from a diverse group of experts. We have Michael Fortune, Kelly Parker, Peter Galbert, Mary May, Dixie Biggs, Jennifer Anderson, Michael Cullen, and Dave Fisher. Of course, there will be some social time between the days of hard work where you'll be able to taste some regional flavors with local food trucks and locally brewed beer. But this event is really all about making and doing, all in an intimate setting. The class sizes are small. That's great for learning, but it means space is limited. So don't wait. Register now and come see us in Tampa. Okay, question number three is from Matt. I would like to get into spoon carving. Do you have any recommendations on where to source wood? And I went back probably every week and looked, and I do not have a region mm. from for where Matt lives. So it's, you know, if you are in Arizona, I think you're screwed. Like cactus spoons. Cactus spoons. That's going to turn into a thing now. No. Would you have to dry it out first? And I mean, the, the right. shortest answer from, because you carve spoons. Yeah. So the shortest answer is a tree, because you'll say... There's this birch tree over in that property. Yep. <laughs> I'm going to go cut it down. I don't think anyone's going to miss it. So literally. I may have wandered around the Taunton properties yes. a time or two and been like, look at that birch right there. And gone back at five o'clock <laughs> or six or seven. And I, I've, yet, well, no, there is one in the parking lot of the shop that, yeah, it needed to be trimmed. Yeah. I'm going to go with that. Now, that sounds really bad because, like, in California, if there's a birch tree, someone bought it and planted it there. Oh, here so you can't stop them. No, it's like weeds. <laughs> yeah. It's like in California, if there's a vacant lot and you do nothing, it will grow tumbleweeds. And in Connecticut, if there's a vacant lot and you do nothing, it will grow maple trees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for me, I've just always um, – I mean – the birch that I was using for a while all came from, I don't necessarily recommend this, but it came from, I was driving along the highway and there was a birch down. And one day I just swung by with a bow saw and pulled as far off the road as I could. And, and it was, you know, next to an industrial park, I wasn't worried about an, a property owner, yeah. you know, coming out screaming. And I think it took me three trips because I would cut up, part of it and throw it in the back of the truck and be like, all right, that's good. And, uh, and then I'd, I'd get back home and be like, ah, oh, there's still like 10 feet left. <laughs> and I'd just start thinking about it and be like, ah, oh, I just drive back out the next day and, and take another piece. And I eventually I took about 15 foot of it. Um, so the answer to the question would be just to call you because you have you know all what? those pieces that you have, uh, I wish I had storing. because I should have given it away because the, one of the problems with something like birches, it's it's such high moisture content mm. that it starts to um, – and the, the bark really holds in the moisture because the bark is waterproof. It, it starts to rot really, really quickly. Mm. And um, I think I let it sit for a couple months and went back to it, and the pieces that weren't rotted had bug holes all, all through them. Huh. So the whole tree now is – pretty much wasted but so we we had a huge storm come by and um somebody here at work said hey i've got a couple cherry trees down so over comes ben with the chainsaw <laughs> and the pickup truck you know and i took one tree and thinking about the birch i i i was worried about not being able to carve it all by mm -hmm. the time it was rotted and about half of our freezer is filled with cherry that's been, you know, mi not milled, you know, rived into billets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I stuck them in some Ziploc bags and I've got about, I think, two and a half gallons worth of, of cherry <laughs> in the billets in the freezer. <laughs> so it's not just sourcing the wood, but if you're not going to use Storm. it right away, how do you store it? Because you don't want it to dry out. 
Yeah, you don't want it to dry out. So if you freeze it, that will kind of hold okay. it in, in place. Cool. I have noticed that you take one out, go to carve it. It's it's not quite as fun to carve. Okay. As um, and I don't know if that's if there is some moisture loss or if it's just frozen <laughs> and a little bit more difficult to work. Um, I was going to say so this. Was a stupid question, but do you have to wait for it to thaw out before you can carve it? Just go in, man. Just go. Yeah, go okay. for it. Because it's going to thaw out yeah. fairly quickly. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but the biggest thing is, and I, you know, I've emailed with Dave Fisher about this before, and the biggest thing for him is he he processes as much as he can and gets rid of the piece with a knot in it that he's not going to, you know, so rive it into billets. Get rid of the junk wood that's going to wind up in the firewood pile, anyways, mm -hmm. and then store it somehow. Or um, does he store it like in bags or something? He stores it in bags. I mean, he works at a fast enough rate where I think that's about all he does. Mm -hmm. um, just stick it in a bag, in a, a, plastic in a bag. plastic, you know, trash bag, and go with that. But he also he will as quickly as he can. He will do all of the roughing work so that. The piece, whether it's a bowl or a spoon or whatever, is close to finished dimension yeah. and ready to be dried. Mm -hmm. um, so his recommendation is to you know get to work. Don't worry about finishing right now. Just yeah. rough out as many pieces as possible. Um, I can't work at that rate, so I just you know allocated some of the freezer to to it. And my my wife doesn't care. Mm. She's got a bunch of random like avocado pits for natural dyeing and fabric weirdness in there anyway so our <laughs> our freezer is really weird it's an interesting place unless you actually want something to eat and then it's like yeah <laughs> yeah there's like a box of popsicles and then avocado <laughs> pits and onion peels and cherry blanks but um it sounds like you need an extra freezer for the for the garage well there's a michigan sloyd um on instagram and his actual name just vanished from from my my uh, lexicon but he actually has and that's his living is carving spoons and and cups he has a freezer in his shop you know like a big stand-up freezer and and he says it's been a game changer for him because now he doesn't have to worry about the blanks and how many is he going to be able to get out of this before it, before it dries out or rots or whatever mm -hmm. um but for for the most part when you find a tree um Keep it long as as keep it intact as as long as you can because only the ends are going to dry out okay. for a while and then when you're when you're ready to carve you cut off however much it takes until you don't see any checking yeah and then you can get your blanks out of that if if you're not going to get to it soon enough process as much as you can get it in a freezer there's some people who who will put them in a stream underwater I think Jenny Alexander used to do that she had like a it's like a cistern or something in her backyard that they, she would just soak logs in. Yeah, and I've like we have a stream in our front yard, so I thought about doing that, but I think there's problem with staining then at that Probably, point. Probably, I'm sure. Um, so keep it long, process it, and when it comes to getting like sourcing wood, I think the biggest thing is, I mean, if if. Everyone you know knows that you carve spoons. Yeah. It's going to come to you. It's going to all of a sudden say, you know, hey, I'm taking down this tree. Do you need it? You know, if you share what you're doing, be it on Facebook or, or whatever, or if you're, you know, like one of us and don't know how to talk about anything but woodworking, you know, and it just – it's naturally going to come to you. If you live in a region with trees, you know, you might not be able to be as picky as you want. You might not be able to always find a birch. Mm -hmm. You might have to deal with maple for a while, which is kind of a bear to carve. Um, and I've, I mean, I've cut, I've cut branches off a maple where the, the sap is streaming down, like mm -hmm. pouring down after the cut. And I thought, oh, this is going to be fun to carve because it's so wet. And it was it was a nightmare, hmm. but um, just share what you're doing with with those around you, and I think the wood will come to you. And you don't need that much. It's like I've got a stack of logs, and just because if I see something on the side of the road, I grab it, and most of it is rotting and it's a waste. And I really wish that, like that birch, I had cut it up and processed it, and just just sent it out to the world to say, hey, if anyone needs this, 
give me your address. And I, that's what I'll do next time, I think. That's cool. So Yeah, as a furniture maker, you have well-intended people saying, oh, I have a tree that just fell down. Do you want to come get it? Because, like, you make furniture. It's like, no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> yeah. And one friend said, actually, it was an acquaintance, so it was a little bit awkward. He said, hey, um, I have an apple tree in my yard that you're welcome to it. Um, you can just, like, come saw it down and take it. Because, like, apple wood is great. I said, yeah, it's good for, like, handles and poles, tool handles and stuff. That's that's kind of cool. He goes, well, yeah, just come over, just cut it down, and you're welcome to the whole thing. But don't do it when my wife is home because she doesn't want me to cut it down. Oh, no. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to stay out of that situation. So, yeah. Yeah, don't that's be. That's a good choice. Don't yeah. be. Also, that that's another thing. It's like sometimes you, you drive, you're driving down the road and, and you see a stack of firewood. And if you're, if you're wondering whether that wood is actually up for grabs or not, it's not up for grabs. Yeah. Don't, don't be that guy. Because there are sometimes – sometimes people stack their firewood a little too close to the road and yeah. it's a little too tempting. But um, if it's right next to the road, I think, I think you're good to go. If there's a brush pile – and I, I – a lot of times I keep um, a silky saw, which is just like a, a really nice pruning saw. I keep it in my truck. Mm -hmm. And if you're driving by and there's a brush pile that obviously somebody's looking to get rid of and – you see a piece of cherry sticking out there, go for it. Cool. But, yeah, yeah, I think it depends where you live for sure, but um, you could even, you know, call someone who sells firewood if they just recently cut something that's fresh. Get, that's, a, get a couple little pieces, I'm sure it'd be really cheap. Or um, Make friends with a tree guy in town. Yeah, or even, you know, I'm thinking about how all these electrical crew, uh, electrical, uh, you know, Tree cutters are going yeah. around, like cutting trees out of the way of electrical lines. Right. Um, you could probably call an electric company and see if right. where they're lining something up like that and meet them there and get a couple pieces. And this all assumes you live in Connecticut. Which yeah, is that's, that's <laughs> kind of what I'm thinking of. But um, yeah, and it, firewood too. You have to live in that climate. Yeah. The, the other thing that I should mention is there are people who sell blanks. Um, Emmett Von Driesch, if, if you're into spoon carving, you probably follow him on, on Instagram. He will sell you billets. You know, they wrap them up and FedEx them or whatever. Yeah. They get them right out to you. He will sell you billets. Or if you're just getting started, I think it's a really good idea that he's doing this. He will sell you a roughed out piece where the hatchet work is done. Oh, nice. And if you just want to dive right into carving, you know, it's wrapped up. It's still wet. It's good to go. He, he processed hmm. it right off his farm. And I, the prices seem really reasonable, especially if you're getting started, because something like hatchet work yeah. is intimidating. So um, if you just want to start carving bowls and handles, there, there you go. Um, there, there, there are people out there who, you know, for, for a price, will sell you the wood. Um, same as furniture makers, yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, all right. Well, let's see. Moving on to question number four. And this one is from Ron. I've heard talk of the problem of table saw blade deflection when trimming a little off the side of a workpiece. I have also been counseled to sneak up on a fit. In my mind, these two considerations are diametrically opposed. Is deflection a problem when sneaking up on a fit? If not, when is deflection a problem? Hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I know what you're talking about, and I think... I think it is an, an issue, and I would say in the past, I'm going to say in the past, um, it, I think it's especially an issue if you're using a thin curved blade, which is really thin. Mm. Um, the plate's very thin, and you're, say, trimming just a hair off a piece of stock, which is like eight quarter, two inches thick, and you're really stressing out that blade. Um, I used to get deflection there, and so like you try to you know, sneak up on a fit, you go through, the blade deflects. Yeah, so I, I would say it used to be a problem. Um, I have a thin kerf blade now. It's a Freud blade, um, which I didn't use forever because I thought I just didn't like thin kerf blades. And I put it in because it was brand new and it was sharp and I was trying to rip some thin strips and I wanted to get as much yield as I could. So the thinner the kerf, the better. I ended up keeping that um, blade of my saw quite a bit and I like it and I don't think blade deflection is an issue whatsoever and especially like a full curved blade if it's sharp 
I think sharpness mm. is probably a more of a key factor. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. You can get blade deflection. Um, and sneaking up on a fit sounds like there'd be a problem. I'd say it's not. I'd say where it absolutely most definitely is a problem is at the bandsaw. Um, mm. A lot of times I'll cut like tenon cheeks at the bandsaw. And if you sort of, you know, make a cut, test the tenon, and it's a little bit fat, and you just want to like dink the fence over just a hair, um, you absolutely have to cut off that tenon and then recut it. Because if you're trying to shave a hair off at the mm -hmm. bandsaw of a fairly high tenon, that blade absolutely 100% will deflect and give you problems. Like taking there. half a blade off. Yeah, yeah. you take half a yeah. blade off with the bandsaw. So... Yeah, so whenever I'm fitting tenons to the bandsaw, I always sort of try it on the end, check, check the tenon. Uh, the tenon, if I have to move it, I chop off the tenon and test, chop off and test because um, if you do try to skinny off a cut with a bandsaw, I do find that that definitely will have a greater tendency to deflect. But if you have a sharp blade <clears throat> uh, at your table saw, I'm going to say don't worry about it. Sneaking up on on a cut is a really, really smart thing, and the deflection isn't going to cause you any problems. Do you ever worry about it? Um, I, I agree. It's more comes into play when um, it's a thicker piece and you're kind of forcing something you might not mm -hmm. want to be doing. Uh, but if it's a thinner stock, and I think the feed rate has a lot to do with it too, like if you're really jamming yeah. it in there. Right. Um, that's going to make it deflect more. But if you kind of feed it slowly, mm -hmm. that'll help it kind of stay in line. Yeah. I did a I did a very non-scientific experiment. And this morning I went and I cut three pieces um, and then used some shims to make it so that I was taking – one of them is a full cut, you know, where there's wood on either side of the blade. One of them I'm just taking off one blade worth – and one I'm taking off like a, a skim cut, like mm -hmm. half a blade if if that. And if anything, and I mean this is very non-scientific, if anything, you can barely feel the difference between the one where I'm taking off the full blade, uh -huh. the skim cut and the and the full cut. So the full cut means there's actually waste on the other side of the blade. Yeah, full yeah. like there was an inch of waste on, on okay. the other side. But what this tells me is not necessarily that there was blade deflection involved, more that there was probably more technique issues with – and people think that a cross-cut sled is a dummy-proof tool. And I, I think that there are a lot of ways – there's a lot of variables that you can kind of work into it. And um, if anything – So you had a stop block. Stop block and shims. Yeah. So what you're trying to see is if there are any difference. Um, it's nice because all your wood is is really rough, and I, it's rough. something I pulled out of the garbage, mind you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a bit, your control is fantastic. Here. Yeah, I did use the the. There was a jointed edge, and yes, there uh, is, and I, a I did base use, and edge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's maybe two thou difference. It's close enough for me. Yeah, um, I'm not. I'm. I'm not confident. In You're not your confident in my test. I said non, non scientific. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I'm not gonna. That's great. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so that answers that question. Good. Wow. Yeah. I but to me, there's there's more variables than blade deflection involved. I'm gonna say yes. There is, because you're right. If there's a sloppiness in your um, crosscut sled, you know, rails. If and there's a piece of sawdust your, your in technique. between your stop block, yeah. whatever. There's right. so many places for it to go wrong. Blade deflection is just one element of a whole collection of things that. Yeah. Did you make it through cut and then take the workpiece off? Did you go and up that, and come no, back? I went back, you know, so okay. that's that's another did you use our crosscut sled in the shop? That's which another is variable, yeah. Which made is... from a four by eight sheet of plywood. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow is bigger than four by eight. It yes. feels like, yeah. There, okay. There's there's a lot of variables, but I I was like I was curious, and I decided, well, let me just go in there, and I mean, I think where you're going to see the deflection is not on a piece like that. It's like eight quarter cherry. Bring the blade all the way up, okay, and yeah. see if you have any burn marks at the top. 
at the bottom that aren't at the top or vice versa. Maybe check for square that way. And huh, okay. I think that'd probably be the more. This is pine. It's in, you know, inch thick, less than an inch thick. I can't imagine you're having any blade deflection at that yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Like but a sharp if, blade too. Yeah. Key. Which is not on the saw right now. <laughs> if if there was actually blade deflection involved, I would feel like it would be in the skim cut more than than the than the blade, than the full blade cut. So that that's why I think the variable is something other than blade deflection to me. I would probably say yeah. yeah. I think you're right. All right. All right, so let's see. We've got some listener comments, and uh, I don't know if you guys listened to this. This was um, episode 169.5. We, we did a bonus episode with, uh, with the Maplewood shop, and it, just to catch anyone up, if they didn't listen to it, it is um, Mike Schlaff who is starting – he's got a program – that schools can buy into for like middle school age kids and everything. And it's a really, really accessible way to bring woodworking into your science classroom or whatever, any, right. any sort of program that you, you no longer have a middle school shop class or an elementary school, whatever. And um, we've gotten a lot of really, really great response for, from it. So if, if anyone hasn't listened to it, check it out. Mike's got a really cool thing going on, but um User 7079840 said on that post, great idea. I took a wood shop class in junior high and it made a lasting impression on me of the importance of measuring twice and cutting and before cutting. That lesson still echoes in my head now in my day job as a dentist. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a good one. That's so. pretty funny. <laughs> And let's see, on iTunes, George1122 said, why can't I give 10 stars? I love this pod. Thank you, guys. I'm often chuckling to myself at work with earbuds in. The looks I get when sharing a funny story from the podcast with coworkers is priceless. Keep it up. Thanks from Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, and let's see. I forgot to think up of a recommendation. Anybody have anything? Go to a Quick museum. Ah. Go to a museum. There's always something... Of inspiration there. Another thing that when you're in Connecticut, there's plenty of. You can go to a different museum every weekend here. Yeah, this is that's true. There are museums everywhere. Yeah, um, we're but, just very lucky, I think. Yeah, I have a recommendation from what you mentioned at the beginning is uh, Mike's book. Uh, I didn't actually <laughs> read through the whole thing yet. Yeah, but just from the start. I wanted to stop reading and go make something, which is a really good reaction, I think. It's like, it's great. Yeah. I've only had a chance to skim it. And it's it's one of those books that I started to read it. And I said, no, I need to sit down yeah. and dedicate some time to read it. There's like so yeah. much in there. Yeah. You're not allowed to say anything. I'm saying nothing, except you didn't mention the uh, email to the podcast where it said, when I heard Anissa was going to be on, I wasn't so sure, but now I really like her, and maybe you could replace everyone else except for With her, her friends. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, it was like so, we want more Anissa yes. people. So, <laughs> yeah. so uh, next podcast, it, it's an all-new crew. Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's all for this episode of Shop Talk Live. If you have questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them into shoptalkattaunton.com. You can also use the voice memo app on your phone. Send us a 30-second audio recording. If you're watching on YouTube, please click that thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening. I did a very non-scientific experiment. Huh. I wanted to see if I can cut one piece of wood into three. How'd it turn out? Three pieces of wood. Hi, I'm Tom McLaughlin, host of Rough Cut with Fine Woodworking, sponsored in part by Felder Group. Season 8 is now airing on PBS and brings unusual, unique design inspiration and easy-to-follow project instruction to woodworkers at every skill level. Check your local listings or visit finewoodworking.tv to watch right now.